Hi, Mark. Welcome to Hi. the Women Waken podcast. Nice to meet you, Whitney. Wonderful to have you here, Mark. Mark, as you know, I am a mental health therapist. So I started this podcast based on my merging of spirituality and therapy, all things aligned, the, the seen and unseen elements of what affects us, what impacts us, how we live our lives. And a big part of my work is about trauma, is considering what is trauma, what affects trauma, and the degree that we experience the repercussions of trauma. So when I found out about you and your book, I was really excited. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Very good. So Mark, you are an author of the book, Vulnerable Minds, The Harm of Childhood Trauma and the Hope of Resilience. You're also an educator, a neuroscientist, and co-founder of Risk Eraser, a former professor in evolutionary biology and psychology at Harvard. So you clearly have an extensive background, a strong education. What led you to want to focus on trauma? I think the, the focus really grew out of um, the work I've been doing for the past um, 13, 14 or so years, um, working primarily um, in school environments with children, um, very young children, you know, four years of age um, up to kind of 20. Um, and looking at kind of the, the different kinds of impacts that their experiences we're having on their ability to learn, um, but more, perhaps more importantly, the the challenges that um, educators, uh, teachers, counselors, school psychologists, doctors, nurses, people who are interacting with these children and and doing incredible amount of work to help them. And so there was that on the one hand, and the attempts they were doing, and then my knowledge of the scientific literature that's been growing for the past 15, 20 years or more that didn't seem to connect up with practice, um, either by the folks I just mentioned, teachers and doctors and nurses and so forth, uh, as well as policymakers, uh, people in law enforcement, victims themselves and parents. And so it struck me as an opportunity to try to pull together in a way that was understandable to the diversity of people we just discussed to make the science come to life in a way that was helpful. Um, and so that's that was really the motivation of the book is to provide both insights into what happens when different kinds of adverse experiences hit children, what it does to their developing bodies and brains. And then importantly, which is really kind of the last part of the book, what we can do to help children. Um, the focus really is on the children. There are many, as you are well aware, many, many books written about um, trauma in adults, um, including adults who have experienced childhood trauma. Um, but there's much, much less on the children themselves as they're kind of experiencing. So I really wanted to zoom in on the children themselves, the most vulnerable. Absolutely. And thank you for your focus and for your work, because I do believe it's a extremely important area to look at. And it is very interesting. I specialize in addiction. And I, I personally believe that the root cause of addiction is in part trauma, traumatic experiences from childhood. Because as you know, when we are children, we only have so much capacity to understand what happens to us. We, do, we can't understand why we're not being cared for, why we might be hurt, why we might not be loved. And so we take it to mean something other than what it is, which is just that we have a caregiver who is incapable of providing safety and security for us, but a child cannot comprehend that. So we take it to be a deficit about ourselves and add that to potentially violent trauma. And you're not only dealing with the horrific memory of that, but also the horrific implication of what does that mean about me that this happened to me? Yes. Yeah, no, very well said. And I think the, you know, the kind of the phrase what happened, um, which of course was, you know, nicely adopted by Oprah Winfrey and Bruce Perry's book um, is a really important, I mean, their book, of course, has stated it very clearly in their title. But I think what I often see is that many educators will see children who 
are behaving unexpectedly, inappropriately, you know, whatever adjective you choose to, to use. And instead of asking, well, what's going on that's leading to this? It's kind of what's wrong with you? <laughs> Not what happened to you, but what's wrong with you? Um, and of course, that doesn't help the child. Um, and especially for children who feel that they've been victimized, that there must, there must be something wrong with me um, because why would I be with a person who abused me? What did I do wrong? I must've done something wrong if that's what happened. Um, and so it's how to change that lens so that children can grow and realize that they were the victims um, and there's nothing wrong with them. Um, and I would also add to this, because I think this is maybe an important part of what our conversation will be about today, is that um, the big focus in the trauma area is often on where the, in some sense, the clinical term trauma grew out of, which is exposure to violence, either being physically abused or experiencing violence as in veterans of war, where the term really kind of grew out of in terms of the DSM, that it's that exposure to violence. I think one of the things that's really become very important, it's an important piece of my book, is picking up on the science, which has shown that it's really important to consider the different types of adverse experiences because they shape what I call the traumatic signatures. So that instead of saying, this is a child with a trauma history, my piece in the book is that that doesn't really help us with strategies to help them grow and recover from those experiences because the different types shape the response of the body and the brain. So as a simple cut, exposure to abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, domestic violence, community violence, war, leads to very different kinds of responses from the body and brain than is exposure to deprivation or neglect. And that's really important because if we're gonna help these children we can't just have this broad trauma lens. It's not going to guide our work. So I hope today we can talk a little bit about how these different dimensions of adversity are shaping up the traumatic responses, because that's ultimately how practitioners like yourself and others who are trying to help these children will help them better. Absolutely. Well, if you could tell us more about that, I think that that's helpful because it's it's critical and useful for practitioners to know what to be looking for and what the right questions to be asking so that we can address as early as possible, what kind of experience did you actually have? And so that we can work from there as far as a track to helping them heal. Yeah, good. So much of the sort of the book sort of starts in one sense um, with the notion of adverse childhood experiences, which I'm sure many of your listeners will be familiar with, the ACEs work that grew out of Dr. Vincent Felitti's really elegant work in the late 90s. And, you know, the simple, you know, kind of summary of that work was that they developed a survey of 10 questions that were given to individuals, adults that asked them about the possibility of having none or 10, up to 10, adverse childhood experiences. They fell in terms of the areas of neglect, physical, emotional neglect, abuse, emotional, physical, sexual, and then kind of the broad cloud of, of adversities called family dysfunction, things like an incarcerated parent, separated or divorced parent, uh, a parent with mental health issues, in your area, a parent with substance abuse um, or domestic violence. So you went through this survey and you simply indicated, did I or did I not have one of those experiences um, between birth and the age of 18? So you got a score, zero or up to 10. And as that work elegantly showed, there's a very strong correlation or association between the number of ACEs a population has and the probability or risk of very significant mental and physical health risks. Things like cancer, liver disease, obesity, substance abuse, all sorts of things that put you at much greater risk for health problems. From that work grew massive work internationally with the World Health Organization, putting this survey out to different countries to see was it this country or that country. And then, Lo and behold, not surprisingly, perhaps, 
Um, the World Health Organization estimates that about a billion children each year around the globe are maltreated. Okay. So that was a focus on kind of the number of types of experience. But one of the key pieces there was that that's a survey about experience. It's not a, a survey about response to the experience. So one of the important distinctions I make in the book is between the ACEs, which are experiences, traumatic responses to adversity, or what I call traces, and then resilient responses to adverse childhood experiences or races. That's critical because some children will respond to adversity with trauma, meaning kind of a scarring of the body and brain. Others will bounce back, resiliently responding to the same kind of adversity. So we want to understand how the response manifests itself, part one. Point two is that there are other dimensions that need to be taken into account that may shape the traumatic response. So in my book, I give a lens or a framework to think about this, which I call the adverse T's. Five different T dimensions, all starting with letter T. The first one we've kind of already covered, type of adversity. And we now understand going way past the ACEs study that there are many more than what I described in that survey. Things like exposure to war, poverty, discrimination, oppression. These are all things that weigh heavily on a child. Bullying, something that I experienced as a young child growing up for years. So different types of adversity that can happen outside of the family. So number one T, type. Second T, is timing. When during development did the adversity occur? Recall that that survey says anywhere from birth to 18, but that's a long span of time. And we know that, for example, for the first few years of postnatal life, that is a critical period where if experiences of loving attachment, investment by parents doesn't occur, you are depriving this frontal lobe area of our brain of key experiences that will cause massive delays, if not absolutely failure to develop. Going forward a little further, we know, for example, that the teenage years are a critical period for social interactions. Globally, what did COVID do? It deprived teenagers of social interactions for two solid years. We are now seeing the massive repercussions of this in schools with kids who are chronologically 13, 14, but developmentally are more like eight or nine. They have really been deprived of key experiences the same way that you would deprive a baby of milk, COVID deprived teenagers of social interactions. Okay, so second T, timing. Third T is tenure. How long does it last, right? Some Adverse experiences may be very, very short-lived. Others may be very long-lived. A child living in poverty, as many of the children that I work with, are neglected and have very few key resources of attachment and investment and educational nurturing that typically developing children would have. They are deprived for long periods of time. Others may go through a short period, like during COVID, where someone's out of work, can't get employed, maybe a year, maybe two years, that's still relatively long, but much shorter than a child who from birth to the age of 13 has been deprived of key experiences. Fourth T is what I call turbulence. That's kind of the predictability or controllability of the experience. A child who's living in sustained poverty it's certainly not controllable, but it's predictable. Day after day, I'm struggling to find resources. Whereas a child who's got, let's say, a father who sometimes comes home drunk and beats that child up, as the many children I've worked with have, that's completely unpredictable and uncontrollable. That lack of control over one's environment, we know causes incredible stress on the system. Every one of your listeners will know if they've moved homes or had a period of time where they're not working, just the ambiguity of not being able to control the environment is unbelievably stressful. So that's yet another dimension of adversity. And the last is toxicity. How severe is the experience? Okay. And that again is very important. 
we do want to distinguish between a parent or parents who hit their children so hard so often that they're bruised or they're broken bones versus a child who is slapped. Both are potentially physically abusive, but the damage done from the toxicity level is critical. So to sum up, these different dimensions of adversity are going to affect the traumatic signature, and that's critical to understand so we can design interventions to affect that signature. Thank you so much for explaining that. And that is very illuminating. And it, it makes a lot of sense in terms of how what, the trauma that someone's experiencing is gonna, going to affect them, right? Yes. The, the severity of it, the duration of it, the type, these all play a part. Now, are, are you saying, Mark, that this impacts whether somebody will have a traumatic response or more resilience to trauma that these the degree of yeah. these these various five t's impact because it is interesting and i often wonder this whether it's people in my own life or clients where i say that's so amazing that this person went through so much yet they're thriving they're not suffering from addiction and other people just crash land they struggle for the rest of their life do you think that that has a lot to do with these five t's yeah, good. So the answer is yes, those five T's are going to impact the extent to which someone is going to respond traumatically as opposed to resiliently. However, the backbone underlying that is our biology. And what we're learning more and more is that some people are born with a biology that puts them more squarely on the vulnerable end of a spectrum. And some people are born more squarely on the resilient end. And now the experiences, those different dimensions begin to shape that. So I'll give you kind of one example of this. Um, some of the best scientific work on the nature of neglect or deprivation comes out of studies that were started in the 90s with the Romanian orphan population. So this is a population that was in some ways sort of discovered um, by an ABC kind of 2020 documentary called Shame of a Nation. It's a very difficult documentary to see. Uh, the sadness in these children's eyes and the living conditions, as some described it, it was kind of a Nazi concentration camp for kids. You see young babies crammed into cribs um, with literally nothing. And the science which is extraordinary that these scientists, uh, Charles Nelson, a close friend and colleague of mine, Nathan Fox and Charles Zena, were invited to Romania to try to understand both the nature of what was happening to these children or what happened to these children uh, developmentally, but also what might be done to help them. And so this is a case of severe deprivation. So for some of these children, the deprivation went on for years, so long tenure, completely uncontrollable and unpredictable, high toxicity, timing throughout all the critical periods of development almost for some of them, and specifically deprivation was the type or neglect. So they had, these were maxed out, high five T's, right? That can be compared, for example, with children who actually got out of the orphanage in Romania and were placed in foster care during different periods of development. So they kind of, in some ways, experimentally could see what's the impact of getting out during different periods of development. So here's a key result. Children who were able to be placed in foster care before the age of two and a half largely recovered all social, cognitive, and emotional skills. Children who stayed later than that showed massive delays in those social, cognitive, and emotional skill sets. And so that's a really important piece of understanding because it shows the importance of thinking about the type of, of adversity as well as the timing and tenure of it, okay? And so that really shapes what we're understanding. Even within that, you've got children who were much more damaged by that deprivation than others, in part because of their biology. 
So some children, this was an absolute surprise at the time to these developmental scientists I mentioned, there were 10% of the population that showed no attachment at all. That was thought to be impossible by some of the leading developmentalists at the time, people like John Bowlby and Mary Ainsworth, who said attachment is this instinct. You know, it's 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 like the way you learn to you don't learn to breathe, you just start breathing. So too was attachment. We have this innate drive to attach. Turned out that with severe deprivation and certain kind of biology, even that doesn't show up in 10% of the population. So the key idea here today is to think of this kind of scale or spectrum that we start some on the vulnerable end, some on the resilient end, and then those experiences are going to push and pull us around that space. The key for us, I think, is that, and this is somewhat of a, a pessimistic view maybe in some ways, but it's hard to imagine that human existence will ever be without adversity for children. So we better build resilience right from the get-go and understand how different experiences shape different aspects of our development so that we can build in the resilience early on in life. Yes, absolutely. Because as you, as you said, it's life as it is now, not many people go through it without challenging or adverse experiences. We can't always control our environment. And I'm always really appreciative of programs like that in schools where they teach children that even if something unfortunate, or even if people are cruel to you, bullying, right? Highlighting bullying is so imperative, I believe, because I also experienced bullying and I know that the immense impact, I believe it's a, it's a form of trauma because you're helpless to it. You feel violated and helpless to receiving and experiencing this thing that is very unpleasant, but you have, you can't stop it. You're subjected to it. You're forced to endure it. And we don't understand that it doesn't mean anything about us. So when we introduce in schools early on that says, let's talk about these things, let's talk about this experience and how you can reframe it and understand it rather than take it to heart, take it personal and really have it impact you long going. Because children are resilient. Children are able, they're amazing. They can say, oh, okay, I get that. Thank you. for." But if you don't, if you don't affirm to them what something actually means or doesn't mean, they will stick with whatever they immediately believe about it. And that belief, you know, as a therapist, I'm a big believer that the, the most def self-defeating beliefs we have, some of the core false beliefs start as young as three, five, six years old. And by the time you're, you're 30, 40, 50, it's hard to let go of that core false belief. <laughs> no, that's absolutely, that's absolutely right. And I think, you know, the piece about the neglect or abuse um, is if you think about um, attachment, early attachment, especially, um, you know, many developmentalists have likened uh, early attachment to a kind of a tennis match. You know, baby child serves up a need, parent in a timely way returns the serve. And when that's a timely synchronized kind of activity between child and parent, attachment really grows strongly. Now, that doesn't mean that every need a child serves up ought to be met with a serve that comes back to them. You know, a three-year-old who says, I need a cell phone, you're like, no, you don't. <laughs> and hopefully that's the right response. And the child needs to understand that you know, they're not going to get everything they need. But if the majority of a child's needs, like raising their arms up to be picked up or crying because they're hungry, is not responded to in a timely manner, the child learns that I have no communicative signal that I can use that gets met and my needs are not being met. And what we see in children like that, when those needs are not being met in a timely way, is they don't develop secure attachment relationships. They don't develop curiosity because the world feels unsafe. Like, whoa, I'm, I'm crying and no one's responding to me. So that gets set in place very early on. And I think that is a kind of a message where when, for example, this is something that's been growing now in the sciences, but it's an important and a timely piece of science, Take what's happening right now in Gaza to 
Israeli children, Palestinian children, take what's happening in Ukraine. We know from some very, very elegant science by a neurobiologist named Ruth Feldman, who's actually worked with children in Gaza, who've been exposed to war, that what exposure to war does is it knocks out or greatly silences the empathy system of the brain. If you are a parent who doesn't have empathy, then you're not even going to recognize the cues of your child who's in need because you can't put yourself in their shoes to see, oh my God, they need something. And what that then fosters is, again, that serve and return relationship is broken. That child now is not getting modeled any kind of attachment relationship, and therefore their empathy is not going to be there. And so this perpetuation of lack of empathy is going to continue to grow. And so knowing that, it's critical to basically start building in ways to regrow, to give you know opportunity for the empathy system to be there despite the exposure. Now that's not easy. You know, I'm not pretending this is an easy step, especially when we see the horrors of children and parents growing up in those war-torn zones today. But thinking about the systems that are damaged due to these different kinds of experiences is going to be more helpful to us now by putting things in place. Yes, absolutely. And Mark, what are what are some other personal stories about people in your life or things that you things that you have gone through seen firsthand what has really shaped your work what has really impacted you or influenced you the most in terms of what led you to write this book and to do this research so i'll tell i'll tell you a, a story of a a child that i i've been working with for the past 4 or 5 years in a school um when i first met him he was um about 10 years old. Um, and at the time, I knew that this was a child who was growing up in quite significant uh, neglect and deprivation. So great poverty, you know, he would often come in with, you know, not having really washed well. And this is in the United States. Okay. So um, I tell you parallel stories from my work in Kenya, but um, this is in the United States. Um, and so I was teaching a class and the class was on critical thinking. Um, and the goal was really to have children with various kinds of traumatic experiences they were living, um, be able to kind of think more clearly and critically about the world around them to give them those skills. And of course, as I mentioned before, through deprivation, a lot of these kind of capacities in the frontal lobe systems, um, are not going to develop properly. So, this is the example. So we're in the class and we were talking about what's similar between humans and other animals and what's uniquely human. And so we got onto the topic of uniquely human and this little boy just raised his hand and he just, just had the answer. I said, you know, what do you think? And he said, sentience. And I, I was like, wait, this kid's 10 years old. So I said, did you say sentence or sentience? And he pushes his desk away and he goes, Mark, sorry, this, sorry the language. What the fuck? Why would I say sentence? That's not even an answer to the question. He's 10 years old. All right. I'm like, my bad. I'm old. I probably didn't hear you. Sorry, sorry. You know, um, can you tell me what, does anybody here know what sentience is? And the teachers are all shaking their heads. <laughs> and I, he, I said, you know, can you tell me what sentience means? He goes, rolls his eyes. Well, okay. Um, it's the experience of having an experience and kind of understanding other people's experiences. Like I can sort of get what it's like to be like a bat or some other animal, but not really. Cause I don't have their experiences, a sensory creature, like their senses are not my senses. It's like, that's pretty good. Um, I said, where did you, um, learn about this or read about it? He goes, uh, you know, on, on YouTube, those, I think they're philosophers or psychologists like Steven Pinker, Dan Dennett. And Ch Ch I said, what? He goes, what, Mark, haven't you read those guys? <laughs> I thought I was going to collapse. So here's a, a little boy who, despite the neglect and deprivation, has a biology that's given him a BMW brain. And for him, my incredible enthusiasm for his gift, his hidden talent of brilliance has propelled him to 
mature and develop and just to devour books that he's being given in school and for staff in the school to recognize that. So that's, to me, it's one of the greatest rewards as an educator of working with children like this is that spotting these pieces and not only when they have gifts, but also seeing where they're struggling and giving them techniques to manage better. Let me give just another example, very, very different. I walk into a classroom for the first time. This was a young middle schooler. They're about eight years old, eight or nine. I walk in and a little boy bolts out of the room. Lily just runs right out of the room. I'm like, whoa, whoa. She says, don't worry about it. Um, you happen to look just like his father who beats him every night. I'm like, oh my gosh. You know, so he doesn't come back. Next time I come into the classroom, I come into the room. I don't look at him. I sit down on the floor, making myself small, look in the opposite direction, start talking to the other kids about a game I want to play with them. And he comes over to me and goes, what, you're not going to invite me into the game? Because I kind of reduced the threat of a tall person who looked like his father, who now see, who saw me as a threat. And of course, that's the challenge for children who are being abused, is that they generalize. And the way to think about this is it's like a gazelle on the savanna. If a gazelle group is attacked by a lion, the gazelles don't conclude that lion is bad. They conclude all lions are bad. And for that child, it's like anybody who looks, smells, sounds like my dad is bad. Very good adaptive response for a child who is powerless. And then in the goal of educators is to help them stop the generalization that not everybody who looks and sounds like the person who abused you is going to abuse you. And so it's calming that nervous system down so that they don't generalize and realize they can be trustworthy of other people. So that's a very different kind of response than the child I mentioned at the beginning where that wasn't his response. He wasn't on high alert. He just lacked the resources to help him grow. So I think those are the experiences that I've had as, a, as an educator working directly with these children. And, you know, the part I would mention, and you're well aware of this as a therapist, is that when working in these kind of organizations, some of the orphanages I work with in Kenya, for example, it's equally important that the staff have a way of being careful not to be trauma triggered themselves. Because working with these children is difficult. It's exhausting. And many of the staff that I work with in schools, they themselves were victims of traumatic experiences. And so some of these children can get very violent. And so they may have to be held just to help them not hurt themselves or hurt somebody else. That can be very difficult to do. I find that if I come home from a day like that, it takes a lot to get myself back on track. Um, so that whole notion of a trauma-informed organization is critical, that we recognize that traumatic experiences are common, not rare, that there are signatures of the traumatic response, that we need to help individuals recover from that trauma, and that we need to resist re-traumatizing those individuals as well as ourselves. And so when those kind of components can come together, it really helps build those organizations up so they can be most effective with that population. Yeah, beautiful. If only we had that widespread throughout the world in every yes. organization, that would be so profound in being able to shift the, you know, shift the needle a little bit in terms of how how much people are experiencing these adverse effects long into their their adulthood into life because most yeah. most of us or most children don't have the the resources for someone to look and say hey it looks like you're having a response to this person it looks like this is challenging unfortunately a lot of educational systems are so overwhelmed and understaffed that they don't have the capacity to attend no, that's right. No, that's, that's absolutely right. I mean, I think the, the bandwidth to learn and integrate is challenging for many of these programs. I mean, many of the schools that I work with, and I work in a, an amazing state, you know, Massachusetts is consistently one of the top states in the country for education. And yet 
no, they've got so many demands on them to, 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 you know, teach these kids and it's such difficult work, you know, so adding other layers is just really, really, really difficult. I would also add something on to, to your last comment, which I think is equally important today is that a lot of people who have ex been experienced, exposed to adverse childhood experiences may not show anything on the surface. And this is really important, and I'll, and I'll use this as an example, which many of your listeners are probably aware of, but I, to me, the most tragic example of this is Sinead O'Connor. So here is somebody who, if, if for those of you, for those of the listeners who, of course, know her, love her music, and loved her music, um, I'd encourage you to look at a picture of her when she was a late teenager who was just cresting onto the pop scene. The pictures of Sinead O'Connor when she was that age, she glistens. Her eyes are sparkly. There's a smile. There's a vivaciousness, a aliveness. And yet, look at her autobiography. She was being severely abused by her mother during that entire period. So what she showed on the surface completely concealed what was underneath the surface. And what we now understand quite well is that stress like that biologically ages us. And so there are real indicators at the level of our chromosomes. You can feed genetically these epigenetic effects that effectively detach the biological clock from the chronological clock. It's like the rings of a tree. You can see the stress on the tree from droughts or overwatering by the size of those rings. The same can be seen biologically in us. And what you see in many, many people who have been stressed by adversity is that they're older souls biologically than their chronology would actually reveal. And that in some ways is the absolute tragedy of a Sinead O'Connor was that abuse from childhood wore her down, even though at some level she was incredibly successful underneath the surface, she was in suffering pain. Yeah, it, it, you absolutely don't always know when what you're looking at. It, it, it isn't always apparent. It doesn't always come to the surface. I think different people have ways. Do you think that that also has to do with the five T's, that maybe the different ways that people experience trauma relates to whether they keep it in or they are more reactive or, or more, you know, sort of presenting with traumatic responses? I, I think that five T's certainly shaped that to to some extent, but I'll also come back to this biology piece. Um, there was a very elegant study um, done in Chicago with uh, inner city um, African American individuals, and the goal was to look at the relationship between self control and various kinds of measures of kind of adult functioning, for want of a better expression, uh, wealth, health, educational attainment, okay, things like that. And what they found was that the stronger the individual self-control, the better those metrics were. Better wealth, better educational achievement, uh, better economic status, and so forth, okay? But what they also did was they measured uh, an indicator of biological aging, and what they found was the individuals with higher self-control were older souls. They aged more. By keeping things under wraps and making it look okay, they were effectively aging themselves. And so here we have the sense that, again, self-control, we think, there's a lot of biology that kind of goes into whether we're highly self-control at birth or more impulsive at birth, okay? And then again, these different experiences are going to push us around in that space. You know, one of the most dramatic studies in, in certainly a psychological area to ever be published was this work by Terry Moffitt um, and Ashlon Caspi, two behavioral geneticists at Duke University, who did this long-term study where they followed children uh, in Dunedin, New Zealand from kind of, you know, birth until the age of 40. And what they found was that self-control measured at the age of three <laughs> predicted wealth, health, uh, educational at 40, irrespective of anything else. And so you've got this very powerful predictor 
So that's in some ways the power of that measure to predict a lot of adult functioning. The flip side of that is strong self-control isn't always a blessing. That by keeping things under wrap, you're shoving down that stress system and it's effectively aging you. And so that is the kind of the flip side of this. And that's effectively in some ways, maybe Sinead O'Connor's story is that she was keeping things under wraps to be a successful performer and so forth, but ultimately it aged her, her wore her down. So again, one of the things that we're learning is that that intense stress physiology, the tenure, the timing, the toxicity of those stressful experiences directly affects our autoimmune systems. And that ultimately is wearing people down. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And I and I have to give a bit of a shout out to my profession as a therapist is also the value of speaking and not holding things down. Yes. And I, I want to talk a bit because your, your book kind of closes with the idea, the wonderful idea of hope, resilience and recovery. And in it, you, you touch a bit on community. I know, I don't know if you want to share a bit about it, Mark, but you told me about a trip you're about to take. You work with individuals in other countries in their, whether it's communities, villages, people who you're helping to sort of build new understandings around these concepts that you speak of. So obviously I'm a, I'm a big proponent of speaking your truth to get it, let it out, to not hold it down and under, but there's also something to say when we talk about trauma at a bigger scale and we say, what, what would help to eradicate this from our planet, from the suffering that you can't stop the trauma, but just as you said, and I think a lot of it has to do with, we don't feel a sense of community. Often when people go through a traumatic event, they feel so alone. They feel they have to get through it on their own and that nobody cares because there's so much else going on. But when you read and learn about people who live in community spaces, they're often healthier mentally, physically, and emotionally because they feel that when something happens to them, it's a sh more of a shared experience. They know that they're being seen and heard and considered versus the individuality mentality, which says, all right, well, get over it and get back to work, right? Right. Yeah, no, that's well said. And I think the, so the work that we are, um, we've begun um, has got a focus on the, they're called children's homes uh, in many parts of, of Africa, uh, orphanages. Um, there's a very, very large um, orphan population in sub-Saharan Africa. You know, current estimates have it at 54 million orphans. Um Kenya alone as a country has approximately maybe 3 million orphans. Um, and this arises for many reasons, uh, poverty, uh, domestic, you know, community violence, HIV AIDS is still a thing. I mean, you know, in many parts of the, you know, Western world, middle high income countries like ours in the United States, we think, well, wasn't that something about the eighties? You know, we, we kind of lost the grip that that was kind of solved here within the United States and many other countries, but not in others. So this population, and the reason why I'm, I'm particularly excited and passionate about this is because one of the contrasting pieces of evidence that compares, for example, the work that came out of the Romanian orphanages and now much more recently work growing out of other kind of low to middle income countries like Kenya, Tanzania, Cambodia, Vietnam, India, um, is that there's something that seems to be different about some of these children's homes or orphanages with respect to their relationship with the children. And that is that unlike the kind of revolving door that happened in the Romanian orphanages in many parts of Eastern Europe, which basically didn't allow any kind of attachment. So you're here for a week and then it's somebody else. And so I, I, there's no relationship that I can have. In many of these children's homes or orphanages within Kenya, for example, the people who work there stay there for years. So they become like family. They build relationships with those kids. And that's really critical. So although there's a great focus, which I think is important to ultimately try to get these children back to families, if possible, or back to their communities, back to their villages, critically important, sometimes that's where the source of adversity started in the first place. So going back is not going to happen. So it's critical, however, that within the children's homes and within the communities within those children's homes are existing, that those kids begin to form relationships with that community, 
the school in the community, the people and the business people in that community. So they begin to form ties that they would normally have if they hadn't been put into a children's home. So part of the work that we're going to be doing is one, a very large library project to try to put library books. None of these children's homes have libraries or educational toys, because as we all know who grew up with those things, what's the most important thing? You got a book, you learn, you explore, you see parts of the world, you, your ideas get enveloped. We brought last year many, many stuffed animals. These kids have no stuffed animals. They, were, they couldn't let go of them. Um, things that are cuddly, warm, that show attachment, books for curiosity, educational toys to grow this frontal lobe system, training staff to understand the signatures of trauma. Some of these children have been abused. Some of these children have been massively neglected. Some have no parents at all. So it's teaching the staff in these programs who have the great goodness of their hearts. That's why they're there. They love these kids. They want to help these kids. And we want to help them have better understanding so they can do their job even better. So that's a really important goal of ours. And many of these children's homes have already developed key connections with community members, with schools. And now it's to broaden that broaden it, connecting them up with law enforcement, with doctors, with nurses, with social workers. So there's an entire community of people who are aware of them and know how to invest in them so that when they think about that question, what happened to you? They have some answers there and can use that to guide their work. Yes. Yes. How fantastic. So remarkable, Mark. Thank you so much for sharing everything with us today. Thank you for the work that you do. Thank you for writing your fantastic book, Vulnerable Minds. Of course, all the links will be in the show notes. Mark, if people would like to learn more about you and about your work, how can they find you? I think my author website is probably the best place to go, which is Mark D. Hauser. It's Mark with a C, the French <laughs> spelling of that, Hauser, H-A-U-S-E-R.com. Um, there they can, you know, find links to, you know, Vulnerable Minds and my previous books, as well as some papers, as well as to our, you know, this International Children's Aid Network is the focus of the orphanage work. Um, and some of the other kind of work that we're doing. And so, you know, I certainly invite people to reach out and connect, um, to collaborate. Um, obviously, this is a big, big problem, but with lots of hope that we can all work on it together. Absolutely. Absolutely, Mark. And again, thank you. This has been such a pleasure. And it's given me a lot of hope, you know, to speak with somebody. I get energized. I get excited about, you know, there are ways to make a difference. There are ways to change the trajectory of the way things have been for so long that it doesn't have to be like that forever and that there are means of changing and helping people. And it doesn't always take that much. I mean, especially, you know, when you work with children, all it can take is just a little bit of allowing them to feel seen and heard. And you can see them just perk up like a flower that suddenly gets some water, right? They, they respond very well. And the more that we are mindful of that and know the signs and what to look for when a child is needing that, the more things can change, the more children can flourish, the more people can flourish. So again, thank you so much for what you do. Thank you, Whitney. This is a great conversation. I appreciate it as well. It's fantastic. Safe travels. Have a wonderful trip. And I know it will be fruitful and amazing. So enjoy. Yeah. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye-bye.